Dr. Archer received a PhD from Duke University, where she worked with Susan Alberts. And before joining Notre Dame, she was a Smithsonian Fellow at the Smithsonian Center for Conservation and Evolutionary Genetics. She was appointed as an Associate Director of the Amboseli Baboon Research Project, where, using long-term field data, she has pursued exciting and innovative research into the evolution of social behavior. Dr. Archie focuses on how social relationships affect individual health and fitness, as well as the impact of social organization on the spread of microbiomes and parasites. So without further ado, I'd like to thank Dr. Archie for joining us, uh, and I'll hand over to her now. Great. Thank you, James. That was a really generous introduction, and it's great to see you all, if, if only um, remotely. <laughs> but hopefully we'll see each other again in person and not, and not too distant a future. Um, I really appreciate the chance to come and talk to you guys. I always love visiting Göttingen. Um, so let's see, I guess what I'd like to do is, is start today by thinking about um, population biology and a little bit about the history of population biology. So in the end of the 1960s and early 1970s, there was a bit of a sea change in population biology where for the first time, people began to follow the lives of individual animals in a systematic, concerted and continuous way. And for long lived mammals, this allowed us to see things we'd never been able to see before, such as individual life history trajectories. We were able to measure lifetime reproductive success for the first time. We were able to see the intergenerational transmission of traits. Um, coincidentally, I guess, this, the design of these studies that followed individuals resembles that of human cohort studies that are used to understand drivers of human health. And as a result, now over the last few decades, many of these animal studies are becoming relevant for understanding human health questions, in particular because animal studies are often able to capture social and environmental phenomenon with greater detail than is often possible in a human cohort study. Uh, and so we're sort of, I don't know, gaining, gaining new insight into human health by using um, long-term population studies. So I am very lucky to be able to help lead, uh, as James mentioned, one of these projects. This is the Ambicelli Baboon Research Project, which was founded in 1971 to understand long-term changes in primate social behavior, ecology, demography, and genetics. The Ambicelli Baboon Project is located in southern Kenya in the Ambicelli ecosystem. And it is led by uh, a team of scientists, Susan Alberts at Duke, Jean Altman, its founder at Princeton, myself at Notre Dame, and Jenny Tung, also at Duke. And uh, we lead the project collaboratively. And our data are also collected by a team. So everyone in this picture contributes to data collection in some way, all the way from cooking to driving to you know day-to-day -day data collection. And in particular, I want to point out four people in the middle. Hopefully you guys can see my cursor. I want to point out Kinua Warutere, Rafael Mututua, Longida Siodi, and Sarah Sayalel, who together collected a lot of the behavioral and ecological data I'll be presenting today, and also the biological samples. So what those guys are out there doing even today uh, is uh, collecting fine grained information on hundreds of known animals. And any given time, we're following about 300 animals that live in five different social groups. Uh, but since the inception of the study, we've collected information on about 2000 different animals. Uh, and that information ranges from demographic patterns uh, like births and deaths and reproduction to social relationships uh, to ecology, uh, such as activities, ranging patterns and diet. So in case I'm sure many of you are actually pretty familiar with the social lives of baboons, but I'll give you a few quick reminders in case they're not uh, right at the front of front of your mind. So uh, baboons live in stable social groups uh, that range in size from about 20 to 150 animals. Uh, those groups contain multiple adult males and multiple adult females and their offspring. Uh, females are matrilocal, so they live in the same group for their whole lives, whereas when males reach maturity, they disperse between groups and may disperse multiple times throughout adulthood. And uh, one of the great advantages of watching uh, savanna baboons is that they are terrestrial, so they spend a lot of time on the ground, which makes it very easy to watch their behaviors. So what I wanted to do today um, was talk to you about uh, a few projects going on in the lab that really do draw on this long-term longitudinal perspectives. 
Um, there are projects that have sort of come to fruition in the last year or are coming to fruition. Some are published, some are not. Um, and they also kind of illustrate, I don't know, the diversity of things that, that people working in my lab um, are trying to tackle. And so uh, spend the first half of the talk talking about dominant drivers of gut microbiome dynamics in wild animal populations. And then we'll switch gears away from the microbes uh, to the lives of those individual animals themselves and particularly think about developmental and behavioral consequences of early life adversity. So uh, diving first into the microbiome, uh, as many of you know, gut microbiomes are very diverse, complex, and dynamic ecosystems. Uh, and they, uh, from those dynamics, emerge a series of life-sustaining services for hosts, uh, such as uh, digesting food, uh, metabolizing toxins, producing essential amino acids and vitamins, uh, even helping resist against other pathogens. So they provide these really important services, um, but, and they, are also, as I mentioned, quite diverse. That diversity is real. So for instance, in the baboon samples that we collect, we detect as many as 30 different bacterial phyla uh, across many samples. Um, in addition, the cells that are in the gut are you know, densely packed and have diverse interactions with each other. Some of these cells compete for resources. Some of these bacteria um, cooperate or collaborate uh, to process um, compounds to such a great degree that they can't actually even be grown in isolation. And uh, a recent paper, I think, sort of summed up <laughs> the, how intimidating this diversity can, can be sometimes. Uh, uh, they said, this is from Rainey and Quistad 2020, which is a great paper, I recommend it. Um, they said, attempts to comprehend the multiplicity of effects, including those on the patterning of diversity, addle the mind. And, and I think anyone who's studied the gut microbiome has felt a little like their brain has been addled uh, at, at certain points. So um, I think there's many problems or reasons why the gut microbiome is, is confusing to study or complex and hard. Um, but I think one problem is that uh, the types of data we've had have made it hard to see the forest for the trees. In other words, we've had single snapshot perspectives, and that's because most of the data we've had come from cross-sectional uh, uh, data dropping in on the microbiome during one day of an individual's life. And if you imagine trying to understand a coral reef or a rainforest using the same approach, um, it would be challenging to, to understand the dynamics of what's happening. And so um, I think with longitudinal data that trace microbiome communities in many hosts living together in the same population, and especially as those hosts experience, you know, seasonal changes or experience disturbances, this type of data may help us reveal some of the generalized, general organizing principles that are structuring gut microbiome dynamics. And so this is a perspective that we've been trying to gain uh, in my lab and also with a, with a team of collaborators. Uh, uh, and what we've been doing is generating time series data on the gut microbiome from about 17,000 fecal samples from 600 baboons collected over 14 years. I'll show you uh, just a subset of those data for animals, for females and males, where we have more than 40 samples collected across their life. So on these plots, each dot is a fecal sample collected from an individual uh, as a function of their age. And uh, in this data set, I particularly want to uh, call out um, my PhD student, Mona Dasari, who did all of the DNA extractions for these. Um, and it was a, a heroic task. Um, and so she deserves a lot of credit for that. And um, after doing the DNA extractions, uh, the samples were amplified using 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequencing, uh, subjected to the DADA2 pipeline. And, and for people who are experts in the microbiome, um, we ended up with about 40,000 sequencing reads per sample. So um, now that we've generated this data set, there's a number of projects uh, we've been trying to tackle uh, with this, this information. And, and I feel like one of the projects is sort of basically simply put that we've been addressing is, does everyone's microbiome work the same way? Or does each host have a microbiome that, that follows similar ecological principles? And so um, in other words, if you have a bunch of hosts that are living together in a population, experiencing similar environments, experiencing similar diets, experiencing similar perturbations, does each host's 
microbiome respond to those environmental and behavioral shifts similarly? Uh, and you know, do we see then synchronous changes? If we do see that, that suggests that uh, the microbiomes are, um, that each person's microbiome is sort of operating under a similar ecological landscape or sort of following perhaps a similar set of ecological rules. Uh, and if that's true, that means microbiome changes should be pretty easy to predict. And it's sort of good news for microbiome therapeutics because uh, there's not a lot of personalization or idiosyncrasy in the microbiome. So one way to see this is to be able, again, to have a bunch of hosts that are sharing the same environment and experiencing the same perturbations. Um, and that's something that is very true in Ambicelli. So uh, for instance, in baboons, all the members of a social group have pretty coordinated behaviors. They're traveling across the landscape together, uh, encountering similar resources at similar times, often eating similar foods at similar times. Uh, and so that leads to some sort of shared environments in the data set I showed you, the longitudinal data set, we followed 10 different groups over that time period. And those groups also had highly overlapping home ranges. So this is showing you 95 or 90% 90 kernel density home ranges uh, for those 10 groups uh, over their active span in the data set. And you can see they're pretty much living in the same place at the same time and experiencing similar environments. So there are reasons to think that the microbiome could you know, sort of everyone's microbiome works the same way and, and will have synchronous responses to these environments. Um, but there's also many reasons to think that microbiome changes will be idiosynchronous synchronous, or personalized to individual hosts. And a couple of reasons for this are first, um, that uh, microbial communities have this amazing ability uh, to transfer genes horizontally. So through horizontal gene transfer, and what that means is that a given microbe can take on different functions at different points. And so a given taxa, even a taxa that has an identical 16S sequence may not be fulfilling the same ecological role in different hosts. So that's one reason that might lead to personalized dynamics. Yet another is that each host is different. Uh, hosts have their own immune systems. Hosts have their own genotypes. And if these aspects of the host play a strong role in controlling the microbiome, that may also lead to uh, personalized microbiome dynamics. And so we've been trying to disentangle the degree to which microbiome dynamics are synchronous or personalized. Um, and so I'll just show you a little bit about what we're seeing. So first we find that, you know, uh, obviously we found a mix of synchrony and idiosyncrasy, but um, uh, I'll start to start with the patterns of synchrony we see, which are fairly modest. So we see that buck, gut, for instance, buck, gut microbiome dynamics show modest synchrony across annual seasonal cycles. So in Ambicelli, we have a, a predictable dry season that lasts about five months from June until the end of October, which is followed by a highly unpredictable wet season where rain is variable. Um, I'm showing you two pictures that I took from the end of our driveway at our camp that show you sort of the extremes of what we might see in the dry season versus the wet season. And these seasonal changes go together with predictable changes in diet. So this is a plot of um, across the 14 years of the data set, uh, different changes in the um, diet composition coming from focal animal samples. And one big takeaway is that across the seasons, there's sort of a shift between eating corms in the dry season, reflected in this blue color, shifting to fresh grass leaves, uh, reflected in that orange color in the wet season. So that might be a driver that's sort of leading to synchronous microbiome changes. So if we take all 17,000 fecal samples and throw them into a principal components analysis, uh, what we see is some separation by season on this first principal component. That first principal component is explaining about 16% of the variation in the data. And in particular, we see that samples collected during the dry season are shifted to the left or tend to be negative, whereas samples collected during that variable wet season are sort of evenly distributed across that principal component. If we plot this principal component over time, what we see is the emergence of cyclical seasonal dynamics uh, that are reflecting somewhat synchronous changes among the baboons in this population. So on this plot, again, the x-axis is the year of the data. The y-axis is that first principal component. The sort of circus tent stripes in the background are telling you what season it is. Is it the dry season or the wet season? 
and the blue bars are showing you the rainfall that we observe during the wet season. And what you can see is that if we fit a smooth to these first principal components, we're seeing these seasonal cycles as it's sort of shifting to be negative in the dry season and shifting to be positive in the wet season. So because this is a nonlinear relationship, we have to model it using a, a, something that will help us with nonlinear relationships. So we use generalized additive models. And if we um, do that, we find that population level changes in rainfall, in season, in climate are explaining about 7% of the deviance in this first principal component. If we look at other aspects of the microbiome, such as um, the most common phyla and families, we see it's explaining about two to 6% of the variation. So these synchronous changes are explaining some components of the microbiome, but we're not explaining everything. And that's in part because uh, a lot of the changes we're seeing in the microbiome are pretty personalized or idiosyncratic to individual hosts. And one way to see this is through an autocorrelation analysis, which will reveal microbiome similarity as a function of distance in time between samples that we collected. So I'll show you now a series of plots where on the y-axis we'll have community similarity with more similar communities up here at the top and less similar communities down here at the bottom as a function of months between sample collected, all the way from samples collected in exactly the same month and year over here at zero to samples, pairs of samples collected up to nine years apart or 108 months apart. So first I'll show you what this autocorrelation looks like for average microbiome similarity between samples from different baboons living in different social groups, sort of a population level uh, synchrony. And uh, one thing you can see is that there's, you know, again, this evidence for maybe some modest synchrony. So uh, baboons, different baboons in the same month and year are most similar to each other in that month and year. And that similarity declines a little bit as you get one month apart between samples, two months, three months, four months, and so on. Um, and so there's a, a declining similarity with time between samples. There's also a rise 12 months later, 12 more, 24 months later, 36 months later, again, reflecting that sort of annual seasonal cycles. So samples from the population are similar to each other in that month. And again, 12 months later, 24 months later. This is in contrast to what we see if we plot microbiome similarity from the same exact baboon. So instead of different baboons, these are samples from the same individual over time. And what we see is uh, quite personalized dynamics. And I'll draw your attention to samples from the same baboon in the same month. And those are much more similar to each other than our samples from different baboons in that same month. Uh, and that, that similarity does decline pretty quickly but the individual level signature persists for you know at least three years perhaps even a little bit longer uh, and so this is really you know strong evidence that each microbiome sort of has its own uh, dynamics um, that are creating these individual level signatures um, work in my lab also tends to be interested in social relationships and the degree to which social bonds uh, or group identity might uh, predict microbiome dynamics because social groups are traveling together over the landscape in a, in a concerted fashion um, they may uh, also have uh, more similar members of the same group may also have more similar dynamics than members of different groups and so i'll show you what that looks like now so this green line is what does the signature look like for different baboons living in the same group? And you can see that different baboons living in the same group are more similar than baboons living in different groups, but are a lot less similar than individual baboons. So there's a little bit of a social signature, um, but the individual signature uh, in this data set is quite strong. So this is a little bit qualitative what I've showed you, and it'd be nice to try to put some firmer numbers um, on really how much deviance are we explaining at these different hierarchical levels of the population. And so the way we tackle this is by using a hierarchical generalized additive modeling approach to try to understand the relative effects of population level forces such as climate, group level forces such as ranging pattern and diet, and individual host level factors in explaining uh, deviance and microbiome dynamics. And so what I'll do is show you how much deviance we're explaining as a function of a model that just has population level forces, 
has population and group and population and group and host. I'll do that for the top three principal components of the microbiome and then also uh, the five most common phyla in the microbiome. Um, and uh, what that shows us is that uh, if we're just modeling population level forces, we're typically explaining less than 10% of the deviance in our data. Uh, if we're including all three levels, population, group, and host, uh, we're often able to explain over 50% of the deviance in our data, at least for these top two principal components of the microbiome. If we look at phyla, we see that groups and hosts are often contributing, or these are the five most um, common, or five common phyla. We're finding that groups and hosts are explaining uh, 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 just as much or j about equal amounts of deviance to each other. Um, and so together these are sort of suggesting to us that idiosyncrasy is a pretty important driver of the microbiome. So even when hosts are sharing the same environments, experiencing similar perturbations, um, sharing similar, you know, dietary shifts, uh, gut microbial synchrony is pretty modest, and each gut microbiome appears to be changing in its own way, and those gut microbiome dy dynamics are highly personalized. We think this is interesting and important because in humans, we would expect gut microbiome dynamics to be even more personalized than they are in baboons because we're each living in our own houses, eating our own diets. Uh, our behaviors are far less coordinated than in baboons. And yet baboons that show this high level degree of coordination, you know, are really exhibiting um, pretty idiosyncratic <clears throat> microbiome dynamics. So um, a couple other projects we've been working on uh, recently have been trying to understand uh, in greater detail what are some of the factors that are contributing to these idiosyncratic dynamics uh, in baboon hosts. And so I'll tell you, uh, give you a peek at sort of like what are these um, uh, pieces that we've looked at. So as I mentioned before, uh, one component we've been very interested in is um, following up on this idea that a given microbe may not be fulfilling the same ecological role in different hosts. And again, that's in part because of horizontal gene transfer that causes microbes with a given taxonomic identity to, to basically have different functions in different hosts. And uh, we can't look at ecological roles exactly, but what we can do is look at associations between microbes. Uh, and this, is, uh, this work has been a collaboration um, with statisticians at Duke. Uh, Kim Roche is a PhD student at Duke. I should have mentioned Johannes is a, was, is a postdoc or was a postdoc in my group. Uh, and so this is group work we're continuing to collaborate on. So what we've been doing is asking the question, are microbe-microbe associations the same or different across hosts? So for instance, imagine in this little cartoon, you've got an orange microbe and a purple microbe, and they may change together perfectly in concert and be positively correlated. Uh, in contrast, maybe in another host, these two microbes are anti-correlated or negatively correlated. And if we were to look across a population of hosts, this would be a highly unpredictable association where in some hosts they're positively associated and some they're not. That might suggest that there are, these microbes are one of, at least one partner is having a different ecological role in that host. This is in contrast to uh, a pair of microbes that are always perfectly uh, co-varying across a population of hosts. Again, we can't know that there's differences in the in their ecology, but what we can say is that pretty confidently that they're always positively associated, this pair of microbes. So um, I'll show you, just give you a peek at what we're seeing uh, in this analysis. So this is a giant heat map that's showing you uh, those microbe microbe associations or microbe microbe correlations. So I'm showing you about you know 400 of these um, pairs of microbe microbe associations across 76 of the best sampled hosts in the data set. And what this heat map reveals is that there's a chunk of associations uh, where pairs of microbes are sort of consistently anti-correlated in the data set. There's also a chunk that are pretty consistently positively correlated in the data set. Uh, but there's also this section in the middle where there's considerable variability in the dynamics. It almost feels like a coin flip for whether those associations are going to be positive or negative. Um, the legend here, by the way, so red color are 
uh, pairs of microbes that are positively correlated. The blue color are pairs of microbes that are negatively correlated. So we think this section here in the middle is sort of one of the reasons why each individual's microbiome has fairly uh, idiosyncratic or personalized dynamics. It's because of these variable associations. So that's one peak of something we're working on. Um, another reason I mentioned uh, for why microbiome dynamics might be idiosyncratic is that each host may be um, you know, exerting strong control over their microbiome dynamics. And one way we've been looking at that uh, is by looking at the role that host genotype may contribute to microbiome variation. Uh, this is a collaborative work with a former PhD student of mine who's now a postdoc at the University of Minnesota. She's working on microbiome heritability. Uh, so as a reminder, heritability is the percent variation in a phenotypic trait in a population that is due to genetic variation between individuals in that population. And in this case, the phenotypes that we're interested in are the abundances of uh, microbes in the microbiome. So the role of host genotype uh, in shaping microbiomes has been um, pretty controversial to date and also mostly studied in humans. Um, and what those studies have shown us uh, is that heritable microbiome taxa are pretty unusual or uncommon. So in, Research in humans shows us that only about 5 to 13% of human microbiome taxa are heritable, and the average heritabilities are relatively low. So if you average across uh, all heritable taxa, the average heritability is about 2%. So host genetic variation is explaining about 2% of the variation in microbial abundances. There's a couple challenges, though, with studying um, heritability in humans. Um, one is that most of the data that are you, in fact, all the data sets that are used to measure heritability so far are cross-sectional. So that means they've had a single sample from an individual. And I've already shown you that, and you probably already know that the dynamics of microbiomes are, are considerable. And so a single sample may not be a good reflection of sort of a baseline level of variation. Um, not only that, but the most common way of studying heritability in humans is to use twin studies uh, where you're comparing microbiome similarities in twin and non-twin pairs. Uh, and one challenge is that twins often um, have shared environments, uh, shared behaviors, and those, those gene environment correlations um, can confound heritability studies. So in the Ambicelli baboons, we have uh, a multi-generational pedigree that includes maternal and paternal relationships that we can use in a statistical framework called the animal model to help estimate the heritability of microbiome features. Um, baboons, as I sort of described before, their social systems also do help us break correlations between uh, the environment and genotype because the members of a given social group contain a wide range of relatives, maternal relatives, paternal relatives, and non-relatives. But the environment is pretty similar, uh, at least compared to you know, what's considered a shared environment in human studies among those individuals uh, in a baboon group. So um, surprisingly, what we are finding so far in the baboons is many more heritable taxa using these longitudinal data. So in fact, in contrast to sort of 5 to 13% of taxa being heritable, we find that 97% of gut microbial abundances are heritable. Uh, and this is, you know, correcting for a false discovery rate in case you're wondering whether that's not correcting for that. Um, Consistent with humans, the heritability estimates are typically small. So the average heritability uh, across these um, heritable taxa is about 6%. So we're explaining about 6% of the variation across microbiome phenotypes using host genetic variation. This plot on the right is showing the 40 most heritable uh, phenotypes so you can get a sense that a lot of the heritabilities are low. So the x-axis down here is showing you that um, dimension. I'll just point out um, a couple of the most heritable taxa that are interesting. So um, Prevotella up here, we're seeing a lot of heritability for some Prevotella, which are uh, linked to um, the digestion of complex carbohydrates, uh, plant diets. Um, another one that's pretty interesting is our most heritable phenotype is the first, a first principal component of microbial community dynamics, um, similar to that one that reflected seasonal changes, also tends to be quite heritable. So the heritability of this one is at about 
So um, that's a peak uh, and sort of summing up what we've seen from uh, these longitudinal perspective on the microbiome data so far is that microbiome dynamics tend to be pretty idiosyncratic to individual hosts, even when those hosts are living in the same environment. Uh, we think that those idiosyncrasies may be partly explained by microbes that play different roles in different hosts, as well as host effects, uh, perhaps mediated through genetics on, um, on these microbiome dynamics. Um, I think it's interesting to think about, like, what are the consequences of these? Um, the, I think these idiosyncrasies, at least from a human health perspective, will pose challenges for designing microbiome of interventions. If you sort of imagine trying to design a probiotic uh, and put that probiotic into a hosts where each individual's community is working a different way, that pro probiotic may not have the same effects uh, in different hosts. So personalized medicine may be uh, important in using the microbiome to improve human health. Okay, so that's the last I'll say about microbiome dynamics. Um, and what I'd like to do now is shift gears uh, away from the microbes and again, and focus more on the lives of individual animals. Um, and in particular, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about developmental and behavioral consequences arising from early life adversity. So um, research in the Ambicelli Baboon Project, not only in my lab, but in Susan Alberts's lab and in Jenny Tung's lab, all of us have been sort of um, interested in these questions. And that's, um, well, in part, because of their commonality with, with patterns that we see in humans. So for instance, uh, it's well known in humans that the experience of harsh or traumatic conditions in early life, such as the experience of war, uh, of famine, the loss of a parent, uh, neglect, uh, can have consequences for um, behavior and for health across adulthood. Uh, there's especially tight links between many of these traumatic events and cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, uh, and schizophrenia. And these patterns are known as the long arm of early life. And uh, as many of you in the audience know, these effects are not unique to humans. Uh, we also see effects uh, in baboons, or not in baboons, in, in many animals, although I will show you an example from baboons. Uh, and so, um, for instance, in our own population, a few years ago, we conducted a study uh, looking at uh, the effects of early adversity on survival uh, and found profound effects of early adversity and survival. So I'll sort of step you through what we saw in that paper. Um, so we looked in this analysis at six different sources of early life adversity that could happen uh, early in the life of a female baboon. We looked at the experience of drought in the first year of life. Uh, we also looked at the experience of uh, living in a large social group where there may be competition for resources. We looked at aspects of family structure, such as maternal loss or the presence of a, especially um, close in age competing younger sibling that may divert maternal attention. We also looked at a couple aspects of the mom's social environment, such as the mom's social rank or social isolation in the mom. And so what we did was we had complete information on these sources of adversity and their presence or absence uh, for 189 different females. And we counted up the number of bad things that could happen uh, in the first four years uh, of a baboon's life. And then we started the clock after age four so four is around the age that a female baboon reaches menarche. Uh, so we started the clock after age four to look at the proportion surviving. And uh, what we saw is that for the uh, lucky baboons that had none of these uh, adverse circumstances in early life, they led, had a median lifespan of about 22 years. And when we compared those to baboons that had three or more of those negative events, uh, their median lifespan was about nine years. And if I fill in the other two sort of levels of adversity, experiencing one or more or two, or one source of adversity or two sources of adversity, we see mortality effects sort of proceeding in a stepwise fashion, suggesting that it's this accumulation of uh, negative circumstances in early life that are having uh, important consequences for adult survival. So uh, since this result, we've been following up on this pattern in a bunch of different ways. Um, and I just want to talk to you about uh, two uh, that we've been working on in my lab. 
um, where we've been trying to understand or identify adaptive developmental uh, or behavioral responses to early life adversity. And so um, the first project I'll tell you about uh, is work led by a PhD student in my lab, Chelsea Weibel, uh, who basically asked the question, you know, do these females who die young, do they live fast? So in other words, if a female can uh, anticipate uh, an early death because of the experiences she had in early life, and those may signal to her you're going to have uh, a um, short lifespan, does that indicate that she should speed up reproduction uh, in order to maximize fitness? In other words, if you're gonna have a short lifespan, you might wanna try to squeeze in as much reproduction as you can before you die in order to maximize your genetic contribution to the next generation. So this hypothesis has been around uh, for a long time in different forms. Uh, it tends to be, it's often proposed, um, I guess most often in, in psychology, uh, in evolutionary medicine, and in anthropology. Um, and, and there's good reason for it. So for instance, in humans, we do see a link between certain types of early life adversity, uh, especially parental absence, and early menarche in girls. So that's a, a fairly common phenomenon that's observed. That also illustrates the most common way that this hypothesis is tested is by searching for a link between the experience of early life adversity and the timing of development. Um, interestingly, when we looked, we couldn't find if any study had tested if reproductive acceleration or early menarche or speeding up reproduction was an adaptive in that did it actually improve an individual's lifetime reproductive success. Uh, nor could we find studies that had checked whether the accelerated reproduction was unique to those who experienced early life adversity. And the second piece is important because speeding up reproduction might be sort of globally beneficial for everybody. So anybody speeding up reproduction might have higher fitness, but we might wanna see if it's an adaptation to early adversity, sort of special advantages under the experience of early life adversity. So um, that's what uh, Chelsea set out to do. And she did so by uh, addressing three sort of questions. So first, she did that sort of classic test of looking whether early life adversity is linked to faster reproduction in baboons. She then tested whether faster reproduction was linked to higher lifetime reproductive success. And then finally, she checked whether the adaptive benefits of accelerated reproduction were in fact unique to individuals who experienced early life adversity. And so I will show you what she found. Um, so again, first, she checked whether early life adversity was linked to faster reproduction. Um, I'm gonna tell you about a couple of results here. So she focused on two dimensions of reproduction, age at first life birth. So in other words, the, the time that a female starts reproducing and then interbirth intervals. So how uh, long it took between offspring. Uh, and so on the next slide, I'll show you these data as a function of cumulative early life adversity. I'll point out one thing about um, baboon reproduction, uh, which is that baboons have one offspring at a time, and there's typically about two years between um, live offspring. So they don't give birth to twins or multiple offspring. Okay, so what Chelsea saw is in fact, there was no relationship between the experience of early life adversity and reproductive acceleration. So uh, the relationship between early adversity and age at first life birth was not significant, uh, nor was there a significant relationship between early adversity and inner birth intervals. Um, but you will note that there's a lot of variation uh, within these um, that regardless of your experience of early adversity, there's, there's pretty big spans in your age at first birth or in the duration of your inner birth intervals. Uh, and so um, Chelsea asked whether this variation uh, is linked to differences in fitness in individuals and in lifetime reproductive success. And as we would expect for a long lived uh, animal that produces one offspring at a time, lifespan uh, explains the lion's share of lifetime reproductive success, and in fact explains 83% of the variation in lifetime reproductive success. That said, accounting for variation in lifespan, reproductive traits do improve fitness a little bit, uh, and they explained an additional three to 5% of the variance in lifetime reproduction. Uh, and so I'll just kind of show you visually what this looks like on these two plots. So here uh, on each plot, lifespan is the x-axis, these are all females, by the way, who had completed lifespans and who were all from the same um, cohort. So we're not biased towards uh, uh, animals that 
that died young. Um, so lifespan is on the x-axis and lifetime reproductive success is on the y-axis. And we can see a nice linear relationship between how long you live and how many uh, offspring you have. And then what Chelsea has done is colored the points by uh, females who were above or below the median at age at first live birth or inner birth intervals. Uh, and what we see is that, yeah, there is a little advantage for starting early and also a little advantage uh, for having offspring quickly. So um, lifespan is the dominant driver, but reproduction does lead, seem to uh, lead to small increases in fitness. So the third question she tackled was whether the benefits of fast reproduction were in fact specific to females that experienced early life adversity. So the, um, to, in order to test this, what she looked for was a fitness crossover or an interaction effect between the experience of early life adversity and the timing of reproduction on lifetime reproductive success. And the key tests here are, do individuals who experience early adversity and accelerate reproduction have higher fitness than those who don't, over here? And then is this pattern different for animals who did not experience early life adversity? In other words, as sort of mentioned before, accelerated reproduction might be sort of globally advantageous for everybody, um, in which case that would be evidence that accelerated reproduction is adaptive, but not necessarily particularly ad adaptive under cumulative adversity, or we want to see some version of an interaction effect, if not exactly this, some version of, of different slopes where the, diff, the benefits of early adversity are, uh, are, are, are pronounced for females who experienced early life. The benefits of accelerated reproduction are pronounced for those who experienced early life adversity. So uh, what Chelsea saw was in fact there were no advantages uh, or no specific advantages of accelerated reproduction to high adversity females. Uh, so here's a visualization of testing for those interactions effects. The uh, data points in the background are the raw data and then the lines are the model fits. Um, uh, that and the, I'm showing you the p-values for those interaction effects down here at the bottom. And what we can see is that age at first, for age at first birth and early inner birth intervals, again, speeding up reproduction is sort of globally beneficial, but there's no evidence that it's a specific adaptation uh, that arose um, in a, as response to early life adversity. So um, what this shows us uh, is that individuals who anticipate dying young do not live particularly fast and don't seem to experience special benefits from living fast. Um, these results are counter to some longstanding hypotheses in evolutionary medicine and psychology. Um, and I think in some ways, um, evolutionary biologists uh, would argue that in sometimes there's costs that come with accelerated reproduction that may explain this difference. Um, and not only that, but in, in long lived, slow reproducing animals, life, like humans and baboons, lifespan is the dominant driver of fitness um, and not so much the timing and pace of reproduction. Uh, and so that um, uh, may make it challenging to sort of have this particular type of advantage arise in, in long lived, slow reproducing animals. Although we'll be really interested to see um, as others uh, try to run similar tests to see what, what they find. So uh, the last story I wanna talk to you about uh, today uh, is looking at um, social consequences of early life adversity and how those might relate to individual stress responses. Uh, this is work that was led by a postdoc in my lab, Stacy Rosenbaum, uh, who's now a assistant professor at the University of uh, Michigan, as well as a uh, uh, PhD in statistics at Duke Xu Shi Zheng. And so the question that they, um, that we were trying to tackle here, uh, is we were trying to understand um, how social relationships may contribute to a link between early life adversity and stress responses. And uh, again, it's pretty well known that the experience of early life trauma can alter stress responses across the lifespan, often lead to disre dysregulated stress responses. Uh, in particular, those dysregulated stress responses are often linked to chronically elevated glucocorticoid hormones, one of the key hormones that mediates the stress response. And that chronic elevation of glucocorticoid hormones uh, across adulthood may in fact have detrimental effects on health. Um, and in fact, in our population, uh, although it's unpublished, we do see a link between the chronic elevation of glucocorticoid hormones and survival. So 
Um, that's not the story I'm telling you here. In fact, instead we're focusing on early life adversity and those stress responses. Um, and the factors that contribute to early life effects on adult stress responses um, are, are debated. And so um, one version of the hypothesis is that the experience of early life trauma alters the development of the stress response. Uh, in, and so in, th in that way, this early life adversity is basically a fundamental cause of differences in adult stress responses. An alternative version is a social causation hypothesis, which says that the links between early life adversity on adult stress are not direct, but are in fact mediated by adult social conditions. And so under this hypothesis, early life adversity leads to challenges in forming strong and supportive adult social relationships. And in turn, that lack of supported social relationships is what causes the dysregulated social stress responses in adulthood. And so in this case, the social conditions in adulthood are the primary driver of this correlation between early life adversity uh, and adult stress. And so uh, we set out to tackle this question um, we did so using a mediation framework, which I'll mention again briefly, but I, w one thing that was, was unique, I think, about this approach is that in a lot of studies, each piece had sort of been tested in, in isolation. Like, we, we do know that early life adversity is often linked to social isolation, even in our population we see that. Uh, we also know that a lack of social support is linked to adult stress responses. Um, but it's unusual to be able to test all of these components in the same subjects in the same population. Um, but doing so is useful for understanding sort of the relative effect sizes of these paths, the direct path versus this socially, the social causation path. And so uh, we did this again because uh, using sort of uh, those measures, same measures of early adversity I talked to you about already, uh, measured prospectively in 197 female baboons. Uh, we also had information on adult social conditions measured annually across adulthood. Um, so these were uh, based on grooming relationships. Uh, and then finally, we looked at um, adult stress responses, uh, or at least a measure of the adult stress response using glucocorticoid hormones that were measured uh, non-invasively in fecal samples, um, or over 14,000 fecal samples. And I'll show you a glimpse of uh, what the samples look like. If you're wondering, are these the same samples that we use for the microbiome? They are, in fact, the same samples. Uh, and so uh, here we have female age on the x-axis and the animal's identity on the y. And then a long, across her life, we've got a series of samples collected marked by these um, black hash marks. Um, and I want to point out that um, longitudinal data like this, so we had basically longitudinal trajectories of glucocorticoids and then also longitudinal trajectories of social relationships. Um, there were not a lot of statistical frameworks to use these types of longitudinal trajectories in a mediation framework or in a causal inference framework. And so that was the work contributed by Xu Xi was moving those causal inference frameworks uh, along so that the, these longitudinal data could be used in those frameworks. Um, so what did we actually find uh, using all these stats? Uh, so what we found, um, first I'll show you the total effect of early life adversity on glucocorticoid concentrations across adulthood. Um, and so uh, this is, these results are gonna be ignoring which path they went through. So we won't be looking at whether they passed through social conditions or were direct, just what is the global link between uh, early life adversity and glucocorticoids. And what we find is that Cumulative adversity leads to a nine to 14% increase in glucocorticoids across adulthood. Uh, and so this is an effect size plot. I'll show you a few like this, so I'll step you through this one. On the x-axis, we've got the percent difference in fecal glucocorticoids as a function of the experience of different types of early life adversity. Uh, and then most important, I guess, I would look down here at these uh, experiences of cumulative adversity. So this compares the experience of no sources of adversity to one or more sources of adversity. And this compares one to two or more sources of adversity. What we can see is there's about nine to 14 percent uh, increase uh, in glucocorticoids across adulthood as a function of cumulative adversity. Okay, so we next asked, what path does this effect flow through? Like what are the relative effects of uh, the socially mediated path versus this direct causal path? 
And what we found uh, is that the direct effect of early life trauma is 11 times stronger than the mediated effect of social relationships. So on this graph, I'm showing a comparison of the direct effect and the mediation effect and its effect sizes. Um, and the direct effect is uh, shown by the green circles and dashed lines and the mediation effect uh, is the pink triangles. Um, well, I will say that actually the mediation effect was significant for all of these sources. So it was different than zero, uh, but it was much, much smaller than the direct effect of early life trauma um, on, on adult glucocorticoid concentrations. So why is this? Why is the social uh, path weak relative to the, uh, the direct path? And there's probably multiple answers to this question, but I'll give you a couple uh, insights. Uh, so we've next looked at, you know, what was the effect size of early life adversity on adult um, social isolation or the strength of a so adult social bonds. And we found that those were present, but fairly modest. So here on the x-axis, we've got difference in social bond strength as a function of different sources of adversity. And what we see is that um, this is sort of showing the, the opposite effect pattern, but it's showing individuals that have strong social bonds uh, or sorry, individuals, sorry, individuals that have ex early life adversity do in fact have weaker social bonds, um, but uh, the effects are pretty small. And you can see that um, here I'm showing on this dashed line, what would be a one standard de deviation difference in these social bonds. And here we're seeing it's about sort of a third of a standard deviation is about the effect size we're seeing. So that's one reason why the effects are modest. Uh, another reason is that the effects of social support on glucocorticoids were present, but also small. So having uh, strong social bonds or a one standard deviation difference in social bonds only led to about a 5% decrease in glucocorticoids across adulthood. Uh, and so while it was significant, it was not as strong as the effect of early life adversity itself. So uh, in sum, what this analysis is showing us is that early life adversity does in fact have pretty big direct effects on glucocorticoid levels, um, but these effects are not strongly mediated by social isolation in adulthood in baboons. Um, if we were gonna translate this to a human health uh, implication, it means that sort of solving these early life effects on health likely means improving early life conditions. Um, I just wanna sum up uh, or, or one last slide sort of pointing at a future direction um, that we're working on just trying to synthesize a lot of these factors together and how they contribute to survival. So in our population, over the last few years, we've seen a link between early adversity and survival. We see a link between female social bonds and survival. We also see a link between glucocorticoids and survival. We now know there's a link between early adversity and glucocorticoids and a link between early adversity and social relationships. And we're very interested in, or we're currently actually working on uh, a mediation analysis that is trying to disentangle all of these factors to understand their relationships to predicting, not to predicting um, lifespan. So that is where uh, we're headed in the future. Um, so with that, I hope that what I've shown you today, um, and I know there's a lot of people in the audience who agree with this perspective, that a long-term individual-based uh, perspective on the lives of animals can shed light on ecological phenomenon, can shed light on evolutionary phenomenon, and can sometimes make contributions um, to understanding uh, social environmental contributors to human health. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank uh, the very, very many collaborators I've had. I tried to highlight trainees involved in each one, but there's also many PIs involved in a lot of these projects. Uh, so my collaborators on the Baboon Project, especially Susan, Jean, and Jenny, and our uh, long-term field staff that collect the data, the members of my lab here at Notre Dame, uh, my collaborators on that microbiome data set, and our statistical collaborators on the causal inference analyses.